OK, so here's, here's another hour of web development, if you guys are up for it. So today, I'm going, to be talk, I'm going to be talking about preparing your site for the web. So all day, and probably for um, the past two weeks, you've been talking about how to create a website, how to use HTML, how to use PHP, how to use frameworks, how to make sure that, it, um, that you can interact with the database, um, things like that. But today, we're going to be talking about where your site's going to live after CS50, uh, because after all, CS50 does not happen past December. Um, we're going to be talking about dom domain names, hosting. We're going to be talking about what cross-browser compatibility and cross-platform compatibility is, and how you can make sure that your site um, is going to operate under all conditions. Talk about error handling and other server magic. Um, talking about performance optimization, search engine optimization, and how to get people to actually visit your website. And finally, just some good resources to make sure that you guys have um, enough of those to go off with your final project and hopefully um, after. So the first thing that we're going to talk about are domain names. Um, so right now you're programming in, in your appliance, you're going to localhost, um, which isn't actually a, a domain name. That's sort of just a nickname or an, an alias for your actual um, Linux installation inside either VMware um, on a Mac or VMware Player on a PC. But domain names allow you to put a site onto the web and then go to something like www.google.com and get that website. And how do they work? Well, you're, you're, let's say that you're just an average web server, you uh, average web, web surfer, and you have a laptop, and you go to www.howstuffworks.com. You can probably see where I stole this from. So how stuff works, how, um, your computer will then ask uh, a local DNS server, do you know where this website is? Do you know the IP address of www.howstuffworks.com? Your DNS server might say, yes, I do. In that case, you get the IP address, and your computer accesses that IP address. If it does not, it asks another DNS server, hey, do you know what www.howstuffworks.com is? That server might say, yes, I do. So it tells the other one what it is. And finally, that information gets passed to, to your computer. And you can access howstuffworks.com. So how can you get one of these magical things? How can you get maybe www.yourname.com or www.ilovecats.com? Well, you can register for one. Um, and there are a lot of websites out there um, that allow you to do so. You must, in most circumstances, you must pay for them. There are, certain do there are certain domain names that are free. If you go to www.co.cc or, or um, .tk domain names, those are free. Um, but they do come with certain restrictions. Um, and in fact, some of them might not even be real top level domain names like .com or .net. Um, normally, I would suggest get, uh, going for one of them because users are, more, are, are just more comfortable with those. Like you, you've seen a lot of .coms. You've seen a lot of .nets. You probably haven't seen a lot of .co, .ccs. So they're harder to remember. Um, different websites like GoDaddy or Namecheap or I use one that's kind of sketchy called activedomain.com. Um, it looks really sketchy, but it's worked really well for me. And finally, you have others that maybe do more advertising, like network solutions. But if you go onto networksolutions.com and look at their pricing, it is really expensive. Um, I was looking at them last night. For one year of a domain name, it's probably not worth that much money. In fact, if you're getting a .com or a .org or a .net, um, the usual price is about $10 a year. So if you're paying a lot more than that, probably it's probably not that worth it. Uh, because after all, these websites don't do anything with that domain name. They just give it to you. Um, and so if you can get it for, for cheap, why not? Um, the other thing is once you have your domain name, then you probably want to go on to either godaddy.com or wherever you bought your, your, domain, your, domain, your domain name and set the name servers for that domain name. And what that means is once a user goes to www.howstuffworks.com, those name server IP addresses are the, are the IP addresses that they would be able to look up. And they would be able to access your website through those name servers. Um, if you apply for hosting somewhere, then your host will most likely give you the, the name servers to use. And finally, there's this thing called a Whois. A Whois database is a database with which you could input a domain name and it will spit out some information about the owner of that site and other contact information. Now, you may say, I don't really want my home address or I don't really want my email address on the website for anyone to see or on the internets for everyone to see. Then you might want to use something that a lot of hosting services provide, like a Whois manager. A Whois manager is simply another service that a lot of them provide that hides away that information and just puts in like, 
who is manager for the name, for the address, it's usually just that company name that's um, giving you this domain name. And so then your personal information aren't being leaked on, on the internet, which is usually pretty good. Uh, so, I, so I myself use one of these services. If you don't care about your own privacy, um, then it doesn't really matter. Yeah, so, so, so a DNS server um, stands for domain, domain name server. Um, and what it is is just, it's, it's sort of like a hash table somewhere that says this website address is going to map to this IP address. Um, and that's all it is. So, so once, once you query this, this DNS server, um, then you can get the, the IP addresses for that corresponding domain name and then visit that, that website. So let's say I'm in my, my apartment. Mm -hmm. and I have my laptop and I like, like whatever domain. Yep. What's the first domain? The first? Yeah, the, one, the one you're like on guest, for example. Yeah, so the, the first level actually is usually just your computer cache itself. So, so your computer so, sort of remembers the last time that you went to www.google.com, it was at this IP address. Um, and then after, after a while, that cache will expire, and it'll ask, say, the Comcast, uh, the, the, the Comcast um, D DNS, hey, what's www.google.com? So normally, when you buy a domain name, and you register one, and you set up a, a website, you can't go to that website immediately with that domain name, because the name servers across the globe doesn't know about your, your domain name yet. So it has to populate. Uh, usually it takes about 24 to 48 hours. All right, so that's a little bit about domain names. Um, they're very cool. I think you should, you should get one if you're serious about, about the project and if you really want to make your project uh, known across campus, having a domain name makes it look really professional. And then the next step, of course, is to have some sort of hosting. If you just host it on your computer, nobody's ever gonna be able to go to it. Um, you could potentially set up a server on your computer and keep, and keep your computer on forever. That's not recommended. Um, so there are different kinds of hosting online available. Um, there's shared hosting. There's VPNs, which are called, uh, which are sort of virtual um, uh, hosts. There's semi-dedicated and dedicated. Now the last three, VPNs, semi-dedicated and dedicated, are usually more expensive. Um, they're usually used for websites that require more resources. Um, if you're just starting out with a website, um, it might just be more economical, economical to go with the shared hosting. And, and what shared means is just a bunch of websites are all together sort of um, on one server on this website, um, on, this host, on this host server, and uh, you can access your website via domain name. Um, there are a lot of popular hosts out there. Um, you know, HostGator and DreamHost, those are very, very big and very, very popular and very, very successful. I personally use one called MDD Hosting. If you go to mddhosting.com, that's my host of choice. Um, I think they're very good. Um, they've always been very, they've always been very reliable, and I've never had any problems with them. And, I, and they also have very um, sort of competitive pricing. Two that I don't really like are GoDaddy. Um, that's also a very popular host, but I've had terrible experiences with them and. Uh, a lot of people that I know have really terrible experiences with them. They sort of go, go after people who don't know what they're doing, maybe are making a website for the first time, and so they sort of con them into buying their, their hosting package. Don't do it. Don't fall for it. Go look for other hosting packages that really fit your needs. Um, and the other one is there are free hosts out there. There are websites that will host your website for free. Um, sometimes by putting an ad on your site, sometimes by making you participate in their forums, but sometimes just also for free. But be careful with hosts with free hosts because a lot of them, a lot of them really just go out of business after after a few months. You just can't keep up with the cost. Um, others are just very unreliable, and your site will always be down, and you, you don't want that to happen. So, and each host will offer sort of their own control panel. So notice that for your appliance, there really isn't a control panel per se. You have to use terminal to go in and edit the files. You have to chmod things by yourself. You have to uh, if you wanted to go to PHP MyAdmin, you have to go to localhost slash PHP, PHP MyAdmin and things like that. But with a control panel, you can go in and sort of edit um, the files on your server with like a Windows Explorer or a Finder type um, application. Or you can go through and, and look, your, uh, look at your databases with their own tool instead of PHP MyAdmin. So there is a lot of choice here. And um, some of the more popular control panels are up there. But if you are looking for a host, then you might want to look at, well, what sorts of customizations and options do they offer me to customize my server and to make my website run better? Um, so then you might ask, well, how do I choose hosting? 
You know, there's sort of, if you go onto any host website, there's a lot of jargon, and there are a lot of options, and there are a lot of different prices also. Normally, I go for the cheaper ones, just because websites that maybe you and I make, especially right now, especially as starters, they may not need as, as many resources as might, say, a website like Microsoft.com. Um, so first, you want to look at maybe the operating system, if you're really curious, you know, whether your site's going to be hosted on Linux, on Windows, or on Mac. Um, Normally, we just go with Linux because that's usually the cheapest and also the one that you, maybe you guys are more f familiar with because of the appliance. And then maybe they'll put some restrictions on the amount of bandwidth that you get, like how many megabytes or gigabytes of, of data can users download from your website per month or disk space. How much space do you get? Is it 500 megabytes? Is it two gigabytes? Is it unlimited? Nowadays, a lot of web servers give you unlimited disk space. Um, and that's sort of a way for them to entice you to get their hosting package. But if you really think about it, when are you ever going to need unlimited disk space? Um, you know, if you have a couple of HTML files, a couple of PHP, a couple of, a, a couple of images, that's only a couple of megabytes. And so usually I just go for maybe a few gigabytes worth of space. And that might be enough to start me off um, until I need more. Finally, they may put restrictions on what sort of, how many databases you can have. Maybe you can only have one database. Maybe you can have two. Maybe you can have 10. Um, does it, is it really important to you how many you get? Um, things to ask yourself. And then finally, just things like languages. Do so they support PHP? Do they support MySQL? Mostly, most, most hosting websites do support these because they are free, they're open source, it doesn't cost them anything to provide these for you. But if you want to use, say, Ruby or Python or some of these other languages, they might not support it on their server. So it's important to look for those kinds of things. And finally, um, do they allow you to do some more advanced things like SSL or Cron jobs. SSL is um, an option where you can make your website more secure by making it HTTPS and encrypt your, your connections. And cron jobs are just maybe scripts that you want to run every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15. And a lot of shared hosting websites do put restrictions on the number of cron jobs that you can run because that takes up more resources. Um, and finally, just everything else that you, that you want to look at, make sure that you know exactly what's going on before you buy your hosting package. And finally, performance. Performance is huge. How fast is my website going to run? Most users aren't going to wait for even seconds for your website to run before they just get bored and they go on to you know, meme base and start looking at pictures of cats. You know, that, that, that happens. And you want to make sure that your, your users aren't bored and that you have good uptime, which just means that your website's going to be accessible at all times. A lot of hosts have really bad, have bad uptime, and that just means your website's not going to be accessible and you don't want that to, to happen because you might be sad. Um, and you can also track um, your host's performance with, with websites like pingdom.com or hosttracker.com. And they just tell you, well, how often is your site down? And finally, you want to see about their support. If you have a problem, are they going to respond to you within 24 hours? Are they going to respond to you within 48 hours? Um, the hosting service that I use normally responds to me within minutes, which is really nice. Whew. All right, it's time for. A break, but I'm not going to give it to you. We'll just look at pictures of cute cats every now and then. Um, another really, really big thing is cross-browser compatibility. Um, what do I mean by cross-browser compatibility? You know, you, n nowadays, it's not just Microsoft Internet Explorer. It's not just Mozilla Firefox or Safari. Now we have Chrome. We have Opera. We have Dolphin. We have Camino. We have Conqueror. We have all of these different browsers. You know. Things that are coming out now, rock melt, um, though those are all based on Chromium. But the fact of the matter is, there isn't just one browser anymore. You're not just viewing these web pages with one application. And so different browsers re will respond to different HTML, different CSS, and different JavaScript differently. And how do you deal with that? Well, in certain cases, you really can't. Your websites, if it works in one browser, it's just the, the code that you wrote will not work in another browser. And it's your job to make sure that the code that you write is universal, that it works everywhere. So this is really dangerous. If you say, well, it's working on my computer. Great, let's move on. Well, it's probably not, not going to work on mine. And when I go to your website, I'm going to be very sad. And I'm going to leave right away. So let's see how, how you can prevent this. The first thing, of course, is to only use standard HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What do I mean by that? Well, there are a lot of not standard things out there. For example, in CSS, there are many versions. Um, if you see any CSS rules with 
dash moz dash or dash webkit dash. Those rules are specific to both the Mozilla uh, browsers and the WebKit browsers. And so you want to make sure that maybe you want to avoid those things. Because if you use dash moz dash, that rule is only going to work on Firefox. And if you, want, if you really want it to look good on Internet Explorer also, you're going to be out of luck. Um, and then for HTML also, you could have you could do things in HTML that work in one browser, but that breaks in, in another. And you want to avoid that as much as possible. Um, and finally, for JavaScript even, there are many versions of JavaScript. And this summer, we ran into a problem where document.getElementsByClassName, which is usually a function that's defined as a part of the JavaScript standard, was not defined in Internet Explorer 8. Um, so over the summer, I was working in, in a lab, and we were building online experiments. And we, and we thought it was working really well until we realized that users who were using Internet Explorer 8 could not submit their results. And so we were missing out on a lot of data. That made us really sad. Um, so you always want to make sure that your scripts are going to work everywhere. And finally, use validator.w3.org, um, which is what we tell you to do in pset 7. Make sure that your pages are validated. That's important, because that at least is a first step sanity check. Is my code actually um, standards compliant? Um, another, another way to sort of help you make sure that your site is going to work under most circumstances is to maybe use some libraries and frameworks. Because these really smart developers have thought about these issues for you. They've gone through and they've written different functions that work across browsers. For, for example, we use jQuery in PZ7. Um, even though you may not have seen it, jQuery provides a lot of functions that otherwise you would have to write yourself. But these, these developers wrote it. And they made sure that it works across all browsers. Um, and Bootstrap, you know, which is another CSS framework that we showed you in PZ7, um, it really takes away a lot of the headaches um, with designing websites that look good in all browsers. And finally, if you can avoid it, um, I usually avoid coding from scratch. If you're, if you're just creating a website for your school club, for example, and all you need to do is, is display a few pages, um, and maybe have your president go in and change a few things he here and there. Um, there's really no need to code that up yourself. That takes a lot of your time, takes a lot of your energy, and you have to go through and you have to find out, well, is this going to look good in this browser? Is it going to look good in this browser? Um, maybe use some of these um, packages that others have already written for you, like WordPress or Joomla or Drupal. These are called um, content, these are called CMSs, um, which basically are just packages that already come done for you, you can download them, put them onto your server, and customize them uh, how, however you want. And you already have a running website. Um, so those code packages are something to look into. And you know these things are open source. Unless you go for something like, if you're, if you're looking for a forum package, there are things that are not free, like vBulletin or ip.board. Um, if you don't need some of those advanced features, you can always opt for the free option. And finally, there is no avoiding it. You must test, test, test. You must test your code on all these, on all these browsers on, and on all of these platforms. Um, and you know, IE6, thank goodness, people have started moving away from IE6. Because back in the day, maybe a few years ago, um, web developers had to always, always, always pander to IE6's weaknesses um, in following standards. And so web websites just looked kind of 1990s for lack of a, uh, of a better way to deal with it. Uh, you can also use browser screenshots to check your CSS. Um, one really cool website um, is browserlab.adobe.com. This is a complimentary service put out by Adobe. And what they do is they can take screenshots of your website running under different conditions, like running under different browsers, running under different platforms, and show you what they look like. And so just to show you what I mean here, um, I created a website last year called Life at Harvard. And what I tried to do is I tried to, um, I, I, I tried to make my.harvard better. Uh, because if you were here last year, my.harvard did not look as it looks now. It looks kind of disgusting. Um, but now it looks a lot better. Um, so sort of my, uh, my implementation uh, wasn't that useful anymore. But all the same. Um, you know, I try to add Hudson Mini, whatever, and it looks it, it looks very good um, on my computer. 
And then maybe if I had more time, I would have gone on to Browser Lab, and I would have looked at, well, how does it look in Chrome 18 on Windows? I, I would scroll down, and I would see, oh, no, look at the announcements box. My text is overflowing. So that's bad, right? If, if a user is using Chrome on Windows and comes to my website, that immediately looks very unprofessional. So I should go into my CSS and find out, well, what part of my CSS is, is breaking here? Why isn't it displaying correctly? And fix it so that all users can see the same website and be just as happy. Um, and finally, well, browser screenshots are nice for testing your CSS. But what about your JavaScript? What about if you have some complicated script that's running? Well, you can always do virtualization. If you have a Mac, you can use um, Boot Camp or VMware um, to virtualize maybe a copy of Windows and use Internet Explorer there. Or you can go on to something like Spoon.net, which unfortunately only works on PCs. But what they do is very cool. They virtualize software for you. So you can run different versions of um, IE, for example. You can run different versions of Firefox. You can run different versions of Safari and um, test out all of your websites there. Unfortunately, they are not free. Um, that, that is a paid service. So there's always sort of this, there's always sort of this, uh, this trade off between, well, am I going to make my website look good? If so, I, I might have to pay for some, for some services to help me do that. Any questions at this point about anything that we talked about? Awesome. OK. Now, we have more things to talk about. How about errors? How do you make sure that your website is going to operate even when something bad happens? Maybe you don't have a page named food.php, but me, I go to your website and I try to access food.php. Are you just going to show me that white page that says 404 file not found? Or are you going or, or to say, well, I'm sorry that I couldn't find this for you, but maybe here are some other re resources to help you search for what you need. Um, other errors, uh, so, so these are called HTTP errors, which are just some error codes that your server might send back to the browser. Um, in case of something bad happening. 400, bad request. 401, un unauthorized. Um, four, 403 is kind of common uh, when you have a directory that's not supposed to be accessed by the user, but the user tries to anyway. And 500, internal server error. That usually happens when you have something really bad going on with your PHP code. Um, but, it, but in any case, these sorts, of uh, these sorts of errors do happen. So how do you make sure that you gracefully handle these errors and make sure that your user is not sort of just hanging there? So here comes .ht access. Now .ht access is something that works on Apache servers, something that works um, and works on a few other servers as well. Um, this is just a way for you to configure your server um, such that you can make it do whatever you want it to do. And some things you could do, you can, you can control your cache settings. Maybe there's a certain page on your website that you make sure that the user re-download every time the user comes and visits your, your website. Or maybe um, you have some URL that's um, like you know, yoursite.com slash test slash HTML slash uh, pages slash hello.html, and you just want that to be yourname.com slash hello. Well, you can use .htaccess to redirect um, one web page to another. You can also use it to do authentication. Maybe there are certain portions of your website that you need a username and password. You can block certain IP addresses, block certain domains. Maybe you just really don't like Harvard students using your website, well, you have the option of blocking all Harvard IP addresses. Um, finally, you can treat things. Um, you, you, can, you can write certain code to make your server treat like .jow or .your name or .hello pages as PHP code. Maybe that'll be useful. Maybe that won't be. And finally, you can use it to handle error responses. Um, what do I mean by that? If you simply add code like this, error document, 404, and then direct them to some error page, you can make sure that the user doesn't just see the really, really ugly 404 and show them something nice. So let's actually take a look at how we can do that with your PSET 7. So here I'm in my appliance. I'm going to open Chrome, and then I'm going to try to access a page that doesn't exist uh, on CS50 Finance. So localhost cats.php. So notice that I created an error document that says, Ken's not find the page. It has a very sad cat on it. Um, and if you go on Twitter, if you go on any of these other sites, if you can't find a page, they usually try to show you a cute picture so that you're not too disappointed. 
Um, you could also have something that's more professional that says, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't find the page, uh, but maybe here's a search box, or maybe here are some links that will help you find um, the link that you want. So how did I do this? How, how is this even possible? Um, if we go into our terminal here, I'm just going to zoom in a bit. So notice that I have a new page inside my HTML directory. It's called, you can't see it, it's called error.php. And error.php is just a file that I made that shows you that page itself. So I can show you what error.php is. It's exactly this page. It says, oh no, cannot find C page. And if you want to see, so notice that .htaccess sort of is a weird name. It starts with a dot, which means that it's a system file. It's a hidden file, which is not normally shown. If you do ls-a, you can see all of the hidden files in a certain directory. And indeed, you see .htaccess is one of them. Let's go ahead and open .htaccess with gedit. Boom. All I have is one line in there, error document for 404 errors, which are also known as file not found errors. Let's redirect them to something called error.php. So you can have fun things like Ken's not find Z page. And there are also other very cool things that you can do with .ht access. If you want to see more .ht access magic, um, this is a very cool website to go to. It's called JavaScript kit.com slash how to slash hdaccess.shtml um, if you want to perform more server magic. And it could be very fun. Ooh, all right, more cute pictures. This is a guy doing push ups, and his cat is trying to help. I think it's very cute. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a cat like that. All right, so we've talked about that HD access, talked about error handling, talked about hosting, domain names. Talked about cross-browser compatibility. Now, how do we make sure that your website actually performs? How do we make sure that if I go to your website, I can see your page within a few seconds? Um, well, one of the things that I think people just sort of forget about is image optimization. Let's say that you wanted to put a picture on, on your site, and it's two megabytes large. Well, that might be fine for us, because we're at Harvard, and we have a very fast in internet connection. But imagine someone in China, imagine someone in India, Imagine someone maybe in rural Kansas who maybe doesn't have the, sort of the same sort of uh, broadband internet that we have. If you have a two meg image on your site and the user is trying to access it, it's going to take them a really long time to download. So if you don't need that sort of resolution, then you can resize your image with something like Adobe Photoshop. Um, there's uh, usually an option called Save for web, web and Devices. And what it does is it strips out all the unnecessary information and sort of compacts your file into a small image size. So you can put it onto your website, and any user who tries to download that, pa that page is going to download a smaller version of your image. Um, if you don't have Adobe Photoshop, webresizer.com is also an another resource where you can input your image, and it'll spit out the, the exact same image. But it'll be something like three times smaller. So that's, that's very useful um, for your users. Another thing that you can do is minify code. So uh, if we take a look at google.com, you'll see that it's not sort of the same HTML and CSS that we're, um, that we're, use, that we're used to. I'm just going to look at the source code here. So if I just scroll down, wow, that looks pretty disgusting, right? This would get a zero on style. If you coded this for your piece set, you will get a zero on your style. This has no spacing. Um, the names look really cryptic. It's all really disgusting. Um, and like the script, the close, and the body, the closing the HTML, they're all together, all smushed together. Now, why do they do this? Well, they minified their code. Notice that this document is going to be a lot smaller for me to download than something with white space, than something with really long vari variable names. If you minify your code, you strip out all the white space. Of course, your browser doesn't care if you have any white space in your code. So you strip it out. Now I can download a smaller file. Uh, now the, file, the document that I download has a smaller file size. It would be faster for, for me to download, and that's useful. <coughs> so um, if, you're working, if you're working with websites and you're launching a website, it's almost always good to minify your code. 
Um, Another reason why it might be good is maybe you don't want others to use your code. Maybe you don't want others to use your CSS. Um, you know, if you really wanted to be stingy with that, then you can also minify your code. And it'll be harder for me to steal it, because I have no idea what's going on. Um, you can also go to websites like minify.avivo.si. Um, ser services like this online help you minify your code so that you don't have to do it by hand. Definitely do not do it by hand. Um, OK, now speeding up scripts. Maybe in your PHP code, there's something that you don't need to do. Maybe uh, there's extra loops in there. So we, we, we talked about code design in, in CS50. Even if you're coding in C, if, you have, if you're doing extra work that you, that you don't need to do, well, that's going to slow down your, your scripts um, on your website. And this is especially important for websites because users nowadays are very impatient. If you're doing unnecessary work, it's going to take them longer to get to the information that they want, and they're going to be very unhappy. Finally, you may want to optimize your database tables. So remember, we talked about indices. Um, they're, not, they're not only good for making sure that you have a row that's, that's unique. They're also good for making sure that, you, that your database works fast. Um, if you want to read up on that, go, go to the MySQL documentation. And you can look at, well, how do I optimize my database table? How do I make sure that I have, I have indices that help me get to the information faster? Um, there are also the little tricks that you can use, like caching. If you have PHP, if you have a blog, for example, and you have, and it's powered by, by PHP or by any other language, you can cache your blog at, let's say, 50-minute intervals, so that you can serve static pages or static HTML to the visitors to your site. That way, the users don't have to run your PHP scripts every time, and maybe that that'll be faster for them to access that information. And finally, you can use something like CDNs. So notice that whenever you download a PSET, you always go to cdn.cs50.net. Why is that? Well, C CS50 um, also uses sort of like a CDN, a content distribution network, um, which just means that it's a bunch of servers, maybe somewhere um, around the globe, that help serve your pages to your visitors. If, you're, if your visitor is getting a page from a server that's closer to them geographically, then most likely your visitor is going to get that file a lot faster. Um, there are also services online that, that help you do that. One of them is Cloudflare. Um, they offer a free CDN service. And if you have large files that you're serving to your users, perhaps it's better to put them on a CDN so that they can get to them faster. And sort of the final topic for the day is search engine optimization. What is search engine optimization? That's making sure that search engines like Google or Bing or Yahoo um, can go onto your site uh, and crawl your site and index your site and when I, for example, go onto Google.com and I try to search for something, then your site will pop up. Well, how do you make sure that your site is one of the top 10? Because as we all know, if you search for something on Google and it's not in the top 10, you're most likely not going to look in the next 10. Um, and this is sort of a topic that's shrouded in mystery. There's a lot of hype out there on the internet. There are a lot of su superstitions about, well, if you, do, if you do X, then Google will like you better. If you do Y, then Google will like you better. It's probably better to look. Um, into the search giant's documents itself. So this is um, one of the documents on Google that tell you exactly how to optimize your site so that Google can access and, and index it very nicely. Uh, you don't have to copy down this URL because this presentation is going to be online anyway. But if you look at this um, and, you, and you read this, there are some very helpful hints in there that Google tells you, well, if you really want your site to be indexed well, then you should do all of these things. Um, another thing that search engines really like is fresh content. If you have content that's updated very regularly, then search engines say, ooh, well, I like your site. I'm going to go to your site very often. I'm going to index a lot of your pages. Um, and so if you have fresh content, then you're, then you're more likely to show up. Um, you're, you're more likely to be more relevant. Uh, you're more likely to be more updated. And search engines are more likely to put your site above others. Um, deep links are also important. Um, if you really wanted your site to look good in a search engine's eyes, have a lot of other websites linked to it, and link deeply into your website. So don't, don't just link to your homepage. Link to maybe yourname.com slash something slash something slash something.php. That, to a search engine, means, wow, they have really interesting content that someone else is linking so deeply into their site that I should really, really put more importance onto that site's pages. Um, if you have accurate page titles, if you have, if you have no errors, that's good, because if a search engine is trying to visit your site and it's getting an error, it's probably going to give up very, very soon. And finally, you want to have a fast load time, because search engines, just like humans, don't have a lot of patience for slow websites. So this is a way for you to make sure that you show up higher in search engine uh, queries, and hopefully thereby get more traffic. Because after all, 
you've spent all this time developing a website, you spent all this time launching this website online, you want to make sure that you have plenty of users who actually see your content. Other good resources to use, um, Google Webmaster Tools um, is something to look into. This just helps you to see, well, Google is indexing my site. Well, what sorts of errors is it encountering? Um, how many pages has it indexed? What does it think is the most important content on my page? Maybe, maybe that's not what I want it to be. Maybe, maybe I need to change my, my website a little bit such that um, it's, it's reflected better what my website is really about. Google Analytics is another very cool tool. You can add a little bit of JavaScript to each of your pages. And then afterwards, you can go to Google Analytics, and it'll track your visitor demographics and your site growth. It'll tell you exactly how many visitors visit your site within a certain day, within a certain hour, within a certain week, how many visitors from China, how many visitors from Antarctica you're getting to your, to your website. Um, and so that might be something cool to see, or it might even be useful, because you're trying to target a certain group. Maybe, maybe you're trying to target teenagers with your, with your website, and you see that most of the visitors to your website are maybe 30 to 40-year-olds, then maybe either you have a problem or you can just say, well, then maybe I should just change my, my website's focus so that I focus more on that age group. Um, Google Apps, if you wanted to have sort of emails um, with your domain name, maybe something like your name at your name .com, um, you, can, you can use Gmail addresses. Um, you, you can use the Gmail service, uh, and Google Apps is one, to, one way to do that. You can, uh, you can set up specific email addresses that are specific to your domain name instead of at gmail.com. And finally, there are web developer extensions and add-ons for Chrome, for, Fire, for Firefox, for other browsers that allow you to go in and inspect CSS, inspect JavaScript, see exactly what's wrong um, with your JavaScript script. Um, and maybe that'll be useful for your debugging purposes, for you finding out, well, why isn't my website displaying correctly in this browser? And finally, if you wanted to learn more about all these topics, if you wanted to learn more about HTML and CSS and, and JavaScript, because after all, we only taught you a, a little bit, you can go to websites like w3schools.com um, to look for more resources. They have very nice tutorials on how do I do X or what does Y mean. Um, if you wanted to learn more about these languages, you can simply go here. All right. I think I wanted to leave the last few minutes of this for questions. So are there any questions about anything that we talked about? What kinds of things are on W3 schools? And what, how is it done? What kinds of things? Yeah. Um, so they have, so one of the very big things that I use a lot is their references. So their, their references details, um, you know, for, for example, for CSS, you know, what, what this means. Or if you, if you wanted to change the background of a page, how do you do it? Uh, which browsers uh, support that command? Things, things like that. Um, and then they also just have very nice tutorials on, C on HTML, on PHP, on JavaScript, on MySQL, on all sorts of different topics. They have, nice tu they have nice tutorials to teach you how to do things. And so it's nice to be able to go and learn more about these topics. Yes. So yes. So the, so the question is, HTML5 is still um, it's still a baby standard. It's not uh, really supported by a lot of browsers. So sh should we avoid it? Um, I think last year I would have been a very big proponent of let's let's avoid HTML5 uh, because it is still it's still very much new. In fact, the HTML5 standard has not been finalized yet, um, and so there really is no HTML5 standard. Um, but I think. Especially if you're designing a website now, it might be better to just go with HTML5 because that's sort of going to be the future. And if you want your website to be future-proof and you, you want your website to work in future browsers, it might be better to start building something for the future than for the past. And also just because of the fact that HTML5 it really isn't that different from HTML4 or XHTML. Um, so if, you're, if you are using HTML5, um, it, nor it normally will work in, in most browsers. You just have to sort of go in and make sure. Uh, with sort of these these screenshots and making sure um, with going on to these web these websites yourself, um, but most likely it won't work unless unless you're using very specific features to HTML5. So n n notice too that for um, C for for CS50, for example, for the video player that that we use, it uses HTML5 um, and HTML5 video to display the, the lectures. But if you have a really old browser, then it'll fall back on Flash. So that's also something else. 
um, have a fallback system for when you just know that the browser isn't going to handle what you want it to handle. Other questions? Anything that we talked about? All right. Then I think that's about it for me. I think that's it.